morning. morning. Welcome to the Sunday service of the Greater Baltimore Church. We are the Catonsville Family Group, and we are so glad that you came to join us when you could have uh, used this time for something else. Okay. Let's pray. Okay. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, thank you for blessing us with this time to come to worship you uh, in spirit and in truth. We pray that your spirit may guide us to worship you in a way that is pleasing and perfect to you. We thank you for this time to pray. We we'll pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Hi, good morning. Thank you so much for being here and welcome to our Greater Baltimore Church online service. My name is Emmanuel Mendez and this is Taji. We are so excited to be with you today. We have songs that we're going to sing together. We're going to hear about Jesus and what he did on the cross and celebrate through communion. And on top of celebrating to communion, hold on to your horses because we have a great, powerful, inspiring message to follow up with that. Wait, what about the kids? We're not going to forget them. We're going to have a worship song for them too, so they can hang out with us adults. Of course. If you like what you see, please, please, please be sure to like, subscribe, comment, and share with a friend. And if you're watching on Facebook live stream, don't forget to share. You don't want to keep this to yourself. Trust me. And if this is your first time with us, please log on to greaterbaltimorechurch.org and click Get Connected. You'll be reached out to. Now please enjoy our service. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, worship His holy A new day dawning It's time to sing your song again Whatever may pass And whatever lies before me Let me be singing when the evening comes Bless the
my strength is failing the end drawn near and my time has come still my soul will sing your praise unending ten thousand years and then forever more forevermore yes. oh my soul God I worship the name sing like never before oh, oh, oh my soul your holy name bless the Lord oh my soul oh my soul and I worship I praise you Lord in my hand yeah yeah oh Lord and I worship the name God I worship your own your holy name and I worship your holy name thank you God thank you God Thanks be to God 
the morning light appears, encourage my soul and let us journey on, for the night is dark and I am far from home. Thanks be to God. What's going on, everybody? Uh, my name is Greg Campbell, and along with my beautiful wife, and here's a picture of us and our beautiful kids, because she's all beautiful, and everyone in this picture is beautiful, and I'm just all right. And so we are from Lexington, Kentucky, and we are here to worship with you all here in the Greater Baltimore Church, and we are here because we're taking this ministry tour around the United States uh, to see where our next uh, place to we can call home will be. And so thank you guys so much for having us here this morning, and I uh, look forward to meeting you guys soon. Did you know that the gospel of God is as powerful and true today as it was 2,000 years ago? I want you to think about that for a second. Was there an emotional tickle? Maybe you felt inspired or maybe there was nothing at all. And if that's the case, you're human. And any, any, any re response to this question just shows your own humanity. And it's a question I'm asking to set up today, but to really assess where you are this morning. When you think of the word gospel, many of us will think of Kirk Franklin and John P. Key, maybe Richard Smallwood or uh, some other, somebody else, because it's, it's, it's really associated with music. But the gospel is so much more than that. And, as, and over time, the word gospel kind of gets watered down or it loses its power because over time, when you use a word frequently uh, it, and it loses its power, it, it means it's time for rediscovery to really understand the essence of what is really being talked about. So it's the word gospel. It's not just a New Testament idea or term. You see it in the Old Testament. There is, uh, it was, it's good news, and there was good news that um, David's army won. And if David's army won, that means it's good news because David remains on the throne and king of Israel. There's another type of good news, which means there's a new king, and Solomon is now king. It's it's good news, and not only that. Why I'm using this this thing of kingship, it will make sense later on in the sermon, but it's 
Because what happened after Solomon, it really wasn't good news with these different kings. It was just bad king after bad king after bad king after bad king. One good king, then a lot of other bad kings. And then you get to the New Testament. And you begin to see this. It's called euangelion in the New Testament in Greek. But Isaiah prophesied that this, there was going to be this good news of this cosmic king that would come to restore Israel to his rightful place and rule the earth. The euangelion, it was this, this announcement or this good news. It was a normal word where you would find like, hey, there's this euangelion that uh, Caesar Augustus is over here at this party with all these monarchs and it was a great time. Or, hey, it's his birthday. Let's celebrate. It's good news. Or you see the comment last night. It was... It was uh, Caesar Augustus uh, ascending to godhood. And he sent out his 12 heralds to spread the good news of the godship of Caesar Augustus. But the gospel that we read in the New Testament is really about the true king. The gospel that we read in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is about uh, the, the teachings of Jesus. It's, the, it's about his death, resurrection, his life, his, 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 um, his miracles. And all this it incorporates the good news, and the good news is simply that Jesus is truly the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And he has come, and he's raised from the dead to usher in a new era to truly reign and fulfill the prophecy of Isaiah. When there's a new king, it means there's a new way of life. And where there's a new way of life, that means there's new things to, to live by. And the thing about the, this message, it's not just a message that you hear, it, it, it requires those who hear it to make a decision. And to make a decision uh, to either follow it or not. Now, Jesus, when he proclaimed this message, this good news, he didn't just hold it from anybody or just give it to a certain group of people. He gave it to everybody, even his, his challengers, even those who wanted him dead. And it set a, a precedent for, for those who are to come after him that this message is a message for all people, setting a precedent for radical love. Now, when you think about this message and if you accept it and you, and you, you make this decision, it's more than just talking about it. It's living it. It's living it where you are. It's living it even when you're behind a screen or you are separated. And regardless of what we all may be going through, and even though it requires us to live, what we can always stand on hope on, because the gospel is true, is that he's still Lord. He is still king. Even when things look dark, even when things look dim, it's going to be greater on the other side because he is still Lord. What I love about this message is because in times like these, it's very easy to get bogged down. It's very easy to only see the negativity that's all around us. But the gospel flips the script where we can give thanks in all circumstances. We can rejoice in difficult times because the gospel, it's, it's different. It's where the, the leaders are servants. The servants are leaders. The, the, the marginalized are praised. The, the hungry are, are fed. The, uh, the thirsty are, 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 are their, their thirst is quenched. And what's so powerful about these words that even if, those, if, you, if you hear it, it does something to you. All of us can remember the first time we, we heard the words of the gospel. It, it just resonated within our souls. And, 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 and for people who hear it and they don't follow, but for some reason it just never leaves them. It, it, it makes them feel a certain way. It's just, it, they, they can um, uh, even be apathetic, but for some reason it's hard to deny the power in those words. I'm pretty sure you can understand what we're talking about today is the gospel. And what I want you to understand is this, is that the gospel isn't just some simple, outdated message. But it's a cosmic proclamation that changes reality. The gospel isn't an outdated message. It's a cosmic proclamation that changes reality. And today I want, to, I want us to be reminded of the gospel of God. And remember the message we all said Jesus is Lord too. In hopes that regardless of where we are, when we hear these words, our hearts, our hearts will burn 
just like the brothers and sisters who were walking with Jesus on the road to Emmaus. And so turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and we will start there. A little bit in, in 1 Corinthians, Paul, through the Holy Spirit, he encourages the church. He calls out division. He reminds them who, are, who they are. He calls out more sin. He, he, he corrects their ways of worship to bring them to order. And here in chapter 15, he reminds them of what the gospel is but also commends them for the response to it. In 1 Corinthians 15, we'll start in verse one. It says, now brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you have received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. For I received, I pass on to you as the, as the first importance that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. And that he was raised, or that he was buried, and he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures. And that he appeared to Cephas, and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than five hundred of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. What I appreciate about this scripture, when I first read it, it was like this first time, I was like, man, this is, he's, someone's actually defining what the gospel is. Because you read the gospels itself, but you also read the letters that talk about the gospel, the gospel of peace, the gospel of this, all this stuff. You're saved by this gospel. Like, what, what are you talking about? It's kind of like um, if you're a, a football coach to a player, it's like, hey, run Z23 blast. Gotcha, coach. If you don't know, if you're not, you know, coached by that coach, you're like, what are you talking about? But there's the language that they understand just by something that is, can be very common. So when you hear the word gospel without the text, throughout the text in the New Testament, you can look in this text to see exactly what they're referring to in a very simple but very powerful way. And what you see in here in this in this in this passage simply is it's like they're commended for their experience with the gospel. They're encouraged to keep holding to it in difficult circumstances to get the benefit of the gospel. Then they're informed of the alternative of their efforts being in vain if they let go of this gospel. And then he tells them what the gospel actually is. But before we get into like what the gospel is, there's a, there's there's a foundation or there's this, he sets it up in a way that I think we need to remember in a way or kind of just check ourselves the first thing he says i want to remind you of this gospel why does he need to remind them well you can look prior and kind of see what's going on they need to be reminded of what they said jesus is lord too because a common thing that you see through the whole bible is remember 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 because as human beings we forget a lot <laughs> we forget all the time and so we got to be reminded like, oh yeah this, this is what this is about because through life it's crazy, it's busy, and sometimes we need to remind, be reminded to refocus ourselves on what's the most important thing. And then it says, you received it. You received it. And that's crucial to understand because there's a lot of messages that's around. There's a lot of messages that people hear, and the gospel isn't one that you just hear. It's one that you actually have to take a step back and receive it or choose to receive it. Because the truth is, the messages that we receive are the messages that we live by. How do we know if we received it? When you look in Acts 2, Acts 10, Acts 8, when it talks about these people received the message or accepted the message, they were baptized into the body of Christ. And so for, for those who've been baptized into Christ, we can take confidence that we have received the message because our response to it was being baptized. That even though we might be struggling or we might be thinking about walking away, but one thing we can actually understand is like, you know what, regardless of where I'm at right now, if I've been baptized, I've received it and can take confidence in that. Now, there's more to it. He says that he goes on the concurrence that you have taken, their, taken your stand, which is a great thing. That's crucial and essential to understand because if you receive it but don't take your stand, then you live as if you haven't received it. And so he's, he's encouraging them but also sets an example for us that we have to ask ourselves, 
am I taking my stand on this gospel? It's where we we um we we take our foundation. It's like the mountaintop where we see everything else. It's it's what we filter uh, these different messages through. It's it's something that we stand up for. We are indignant about it. It's where we where we derive our our principles and where we live our life, no matter where we are and what's going on around us. Therefore, I says hold firm. Hold firm, which is this daily thing. And the benefit of holding firm to it, choosing to hold firm daily, is that you will be saved. And it's much more than just this eternity. It's everyday life. Save from the pains and the griefs. Uh, save from making uh, terrible and uh, consequential uh, decisions. Um, this, so it's like this, this gospel has, has um, impact, not just for the eternity, but the present. And that is the power that this message has in our life. Now for me, a little bit about my story is I have a natural imprint or a, a belief that I have no worth or I'm not valuable. And it comes from an imprint of rejection um, and uh, abandonment from my parents. And so football was this thing that I felt like when I played football, I got a bunch of praise. Hey, people like me and find value. And after I got injured, it was reinforced that I had no value because those people that praised me were quiet or just no longer in my life. And so it wasn't until this gospel came into my life to really make me see me differently, but also my situation to see that the imprint that caused this is actually good news because the good news is despite this, Jesus still remains on the throne and that it, he can change the narrative that I've been imprinted on. What do I mean by this? You know, at, at, at a young age, I felt rejected by my mother because it was always you got to behave, you got to act right, you have to do this and that. And whenever I tried to be good, it just was met with... Um, um, discipline and I didn't understand and then my father he worked this terrible shift and whereas third shift and, and during the days like he's sleep and my brothers are at school my mom's at work and I'm here three four years old at my at, at home having to take care of myself and bored out of my mind wishing I had my dad to play with but but, but I was like I understand that he has to work but I have these needs and these feelings what do I do with this and taking a step back and, and kind of just working through these things, I was able to see, you know what, I can't really blame them because them being born in 1960 in the South, what they had to really deal with. I mean, my dad, they had, I mean, lynchings was an everyday thing. KKK poisoned their well water. FBI got involved and said, sorry about you. I mean, there's his brother got murdered like out of the blue. And here they are in the 80s. 20, 20 some years later, how do we raise black boys in America with what we have going on? My mom, in the way that she raised us, it was to prepare us to live in this white majority world. My dad worked this terrible hour so that he can provide enough to give us opportunities that, we, that he didn't have. And so I look at that, I'm just like, you know what, they tried their best. There's compassion for that. But also, it's partly of if in their imperfections and, and, and mistakes. And maybe this, the gospel made me see God in a way that he really is not only the king of kings and the Lord of lords, but he really is this father that is truly amazing. And it changed my life radical, in a radical way. But what is more is, I think a lot of us can forget that in our own pains, in traumas that God is still God, that he's still sitting on the throne, that what we might be perceiving as bad is actually him still working around us. And that's because the gospel is still true. He's still on his throne. It's still powerful. He can change your situation. And in these different difficult times to move forward, what we have to do is remember the gospel's power. We have to remember the gospel's power when all hope seems lost. Because when we for forget the power of the gospel, we are in danger of our life and what we're living to be in vain. When you break down the gospel, it says, in first importance, he says five beautiful words, which is Christ died for our sins. Christ 
died for our sins. We hear that just as often as we hear the word gospel. And sometimes we can forget what that means. Christ died. Like he, he for real died. Like a, a, he a road to agony on the cross. He, he, uh, he had all these different lashes. You, you see him in the garden like, God, take this from me. Is there another way? It wasn't something he was just like, huh, huh, huh. No, he's just like, there has to be another way. He willingly died. Is it for our sins? And sometimes we it, we don't really make a sense of that. We're like, yeah, it's like, couldn't God just like snap his fingers and our and our sins could have been gone? Absolutely, he's God. He could have done that. But that's not the choice. The way he wanted to go about it, because there was a, such a bigger message that he was trying to portray to us. You know, when when Jesus died on the cross, there was a spiritual transaction that happened. It was a life for a life. And the death of his son, he chose his method as what Romans 5 says, it's a demonstration of his love for us. That while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. This was the demonstration of his love. Like he died for our sins as a demonstration of, our, of, of his love for us because he understood that sin separates us from him. But not does it only separate us from him, it destroys our hearts. Because without this, this, this loving sacrifice, there's no forgiveness. Without forgiveness, it's, we're only left with guilt. We're only left with guilt. What's next is shame. When we feel bad for who we are. But as God's imagers, his children, that's not what he wants us to see us as. He saw us that in despite our mishaps that we were worth dying for, because we are his children. We are his children. And what I love about the sacrifice is that we don't have to feel guilty anymore. We don't. Not in a way of like we can just go do whatever we want, but we don't have to feel guilty anymore. Hebrews 10 verse 1 says the, the law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. For this reason, it can never, by the same sacrifices repeated endlessly year after year, make perfect those who draw near to worship. Otherwise, they would... Would they not have stopped being offered? For the worshipers would have been cleansed once and for all and would no longer have felt guilty for their sins. Meaning that if the law could have been perfect, made everything perfect, there would have been no reason for sacrifices and people would no longer feel guilty. But Jesus' sacrifice makes things perfect or we don't have to be guilty anymore. And in that guilt, it's like when we do mess up or we see that we're, we're walking in ways, we don't have to feel shameful, that we can walk towards it in the light and to look at God right in his face and know that he's still going to love us. That is the love that he gives you and I. The next thing it says is that he was buried. He makes note that he was buried to say like, yo, he died, died, like... He was dead, like his body was like rotten, stank, like he was stank dead, okay? Like that's, that was how, how, how can I put this in different way? Things like the, the living God died, died, okay? And it's essential to grasp this to understand because if he didn't really die, it really don't see how powerful he is because this is how, how much cosmic power he has is that when he was raised, it's like, the living God died, and he was so powerful that after he died, he had enough power to raise himself from the dead. <laughs> it's that power that's in the message, but it's also in the spirit for those who are baptized into Christ. And it's this message to show that it's like we have so much power in our disposal that he's given us. That if he has the power to, to really have the power to resurrect himself from the dead to conquer death, then there's situations in our lives and around us that we can perceive as dead, that through this power of this message, it can be raised to life. Maybe it's your faith. Maybe it's, it's broken relationships. Maybe it's your purpose. Maybe it's your outlook on life. And lastly, he said, it's according to the scriptures, meaning that it's divine. And the scriptures he's referring to is the Old Testament. And I mean, these prophecies were fulfilled. It's like, 
It's like if I were to tell you um, in 25 years on April 2nd, someone's going to come up to you in a green t-shirt and say, and give you a hundred bucks and say, Merry Christmas. You're probably going to think I'm crazy. But if it happens, you're either going to think I'm a prophet or I'm so bored with my life in 25 years that I stalked you for that long time to really set this up for you to make you think I was something I'm not. And most likely you won't think that. But most likely you don't think there's something divine going on here. And that's what this message is. It's so divine that it's over thousands of years being fulfilled in a moment to see that this, like, this is the only thing that matters, that it's true. That times when we think like, you know what, this is not going to work for me. There's no way that this old book with these old words are really going to change my situation. I beg to differ. To be honest with you, I'm here in the Davis' barn. And I'm unemployed. (laughs) And I'm so grateful to be able to share this message. Because a month ago, we got let go in probably in a very painful way. And we've been on this tour for about a month to figure out where are we going to land in the best place for us spiritually. And through the wounds and the damage that's been revealed in this time, What's also been revealed is that God is taking care of us. Like there's so many things that that we've been able to experience in this time that has really begun to heal us. It's begun to encourage us. It's begun to give us hope that, you know what? We don't know where we're going to land, but it's going to be okay. That there are greener pastures because these greener pastures are being watered because of the brothers and sisters that are there. And that even when I'm like fearful, I'm like, I don't know where I'm going to live. I got two kids like and I got to move. I hate moving because there's just so much into it. But it's just like, you know, if God's got this, let me just enjoy this. Let me just enjoy this moment in time. Yeah, there's so much unknown. I'm unemployed. But who cares? (laughs) Jesus may come back tomorrow because it's in the gospel message. (laughs) And so in that, I can take peace like, you know what? It's all going to be okay. So what I want you to think is, do you believe that the gospel is just as true and powerful today as it was 2,000 years ago? Not simply know it, but really believe it. Knowing and believing are two totally different things. When you believe it, it's, it's within your soul. It's in everything that you do. I want you guys to take some time today to think about this question, to begin to assess, where are you? Where are you? And in assessing, it's like, what what is holding you back from believing this message to be true? Or if you do believe it, what is the message pushing you to do? What is it pushing you to grow in? How is it pushing you to be more like Jesus? Because I promise you that if you in this time, you're really focusing on just like the gospel really can change my situation. If I just simply believe it, I promise you you will find forgiveness. You will find healing. You will find reconciliation. You will find hope. You will find purpose. And you will find peace. Because that is what the gospel promises. We're all at different places. And the gospel meets each and every one of us right where we are. That regardless of where we are, since it's a message of power, it's a power that conquers death, that it can meet all of us where we are. And because the gospel is true, everything that we do in the name of Jesus is never in vain. Even if it's simply just waking up and choosing to follow him today, to follow him for another second, whatever it is, it's never in vain. In verse 58, it says, Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. These aren't my words. These are the words of Paul speaking through the Holy Spirit. If the message was true for him in those days, 
If the message was true 2,000 years ago, if the message was so true that through the years it's allowed you to say Jesus is Lord, what could it do for you today? I want to thank each and every one of you for um, taking the time to listen to what God has put in my heart this morning. Uh, I appreciate being out here with to worship you all, with you all this morning. And um, before we continue with the rest of today's service, um, I want to pray for communion. Father in heaven, we are grateful that your message is true. God, we are grateful that you have chosen in each and every one of us to be your imagers. And God, that even when all hope is lost, God, you are still working. God, I thank you so much. Just We know that you are still working because you worked for us when we didn't deserve it. God, you sent your son to die for each and every one of us because you wanted us to see how much you love us and that everything that you have done has been for your children that are dearly loved. And God, when we take this, when we take the bread and the juice this morning, that we can sit back and just say, man, like this is a time to remember because we forget to remember the gospel that each and every one of us have received. And that we're not just taking the juice in the, in the cup this morning or in the, in the bread this morning in vain, but we're, we're, we're choosing to remember to stand firm and to take our stand on this every single day. So that we can not only be with you, but that we can be saved from the corruption that's in the world every, every single day and all around us. God, thank you so much for being a merciful God. Thank you for being a loving God. And thank you for being the Father that we all need. I pray this in your son's name. Amen. Growing up in the Midwest, um, in Indiana, uh, my parents tried to teach us how to maintain our culture. 
when I turned 19, my dad said, you know, we're going to help fi find you a husband. And so this was kind of surprising to me because I was ingrained in the American culture too. So um, I think my parents just were doing the best they could to, you know, help us maintain our culture and follow the way they thought would be beneficial for my brother and I. I think because I was uh, having a lot of internal issues as far as trauma and things, um, it just put me further and further into more pain. Um, I got into relationships in my 20s and 30s where um, they were not healthy because I didn't know what a healthy relationship was. I did not see that around me. And so I ended up, you know, being in an abusive relationship. Um, you know, many, many things happened in those 20s and 30s. And so, um, which left me even more bitter. I was very bitter and very confused. And, and I, I do remember like shouting at people, shouting, screaming. Um, you know, I, I entered into the church at age 39 and I eventually met a, a disciple, but his name was Jeff Bargman. And um, he was a little bit older than me and he had been in the church for many years and he had raised um, his children in the church. He was a single dad. And um, I think the fact that there was a brother interested in me was very exciting. You know, I think with Jeff and I, he knew how to, you know, he knew how my personality was and he was kind of a laid back, kind of um, strong, silent type. Uh, but he was very wise and he knew um, how to communicate with me. I had some issues, you know, still from the previous trauma, but you know, as a disciple, you're working through those things and you're growing. So I did move to Omaha to get to know Jeff more. And eventually we did date. We, we did get engaged and we did get married. Um, and it was, it was like a dream come true. My, my parents who were opposed to me being a disciple, um, eventually they came around, they walked me down the aisle to get married. Jeff's children were in the wedding. His grandson was the ring bearer. So it was a very, very special time. A few months into our marriage, uh, I think, uh, maybe four months into our marriage, uh, Jeff began to just mention, um, that something was affecting him in his stomach. Um, he was complaining a little bit about that. And then, um, so we got married in October and the following spring, he started talking more about this discomfort and pain in his stomach. I got a text from Tim and telling me to come to the hospital. Um, so I came to the hospital after work and they had already done the test. And, um, I was standing at Jeff's bedside and, uh, Tim, Wendy and two other ministers in the church. Um, Carla and Jeff Lessman, we were all six of us in the room and the doctor came in and read the results from the scan and some other things and it was shocking. I mean, I think time just stopped really. They, the doctor that day at the hospital um, started reading the results and the cancer, it, it was cancer and it had spread all over. I mean, it was everywhere. And as far as the pain Jeff had had, you know, I remember just standing, holding Jeff's hand while he was laying in the bed, the hospital bed and just, we both cried. And we were just, I mean, just so shocked. And I had not seen Jeff cry before. And so I saw him cry that day. I don't have any regrets about being married and now being a widow, being married only for 10 months. I don't because I felt like I, gave everything to this man, Jeff Bargman. I gave everything, all of me, because I, it's almost like I waited my whole life just to be with this person. And I feel like I got my dream come true. And I was able to serve him in his time of need and we loved each other so deeply. And I'm glad that I got to experience what it is to be loved by another man. 
I think uh, being single and a woman in the church is hard, but being an older single woman is definitely hard. We have dreams too, just like everybody. I think sometimes people may give singles pat answers and say, you know, God doesn't promise everybody somebody. And I think that's that's not really fair to say to somebody, you know, especially when they're hurting, you know, because I think saying something like, well, God doesn't promise everybody. I think that's kind of like um, saying, well, then, you know, your dream is not that big of a deal. What I would like to say to other singles who, especially people who have been single a very long time, that I hear you. I see you. We see you. Most importantly, God sees you. It is not easy. I understand waiting and having a dream in your heart and wondering where this dream will go, if it will ever happen. And that is very hard to wait and to have the faith to continue day after day to have this faith. And, you know, along with that, you are doubting. I know I've gone through seasons of doubting and wondering what is happening, what is going on. And I feel like I, would, I want to say that God is aware. He says he wants to give you the desires of your heart. Don't give up. Be encouraged and keep the faith. Hey there, I hope you've been able to connect with God through the worship so far. Right now, we get to continue in our worship by the all-important act of giving. That's right, when we give our money to God's church, we get to engage in the spiritual act of generosity. What a way to show our faith in God and willingness to support His ministry. So let's talk practicals. As disciples, we should set aside a sum of money in keeping with our income for the special purpose of contribution. When every member gives, no matter how little, our contribution can help accomplish some amazing things. At the Greater Baltimore Church, every week we give to support the general operations of the church. 3% of our weekly giving automatically goes to support personal benevolence, which goes towards needs of those in and outside the church. On the fourth Sunday of every month, we specifically collect for Hope Worldwide, the charitable arm of our church. Hope Worldwide supports the needs of 1.5 million people all over the globe. So let's make sure we help them help the world. Once a year, we take up special missions collection to support our missions work locally and around the world. Look out for an announcement when we take up contribution for this essential work. Even when not meeting in person, giving has never been easier. You can log into the Church Center Planning app and select Give. Text to give at 84321, or you can even mail in a check. Head to greaterbaltimorechurch.org slash give to read up more on these options, or if you want to give. Thank you so much for your contribution. We hope this has been helpful. Now, back to the service.
That was an amazing service. Yes, it was. And if you liked it too, be sure to leave a comment and share with your friends and family. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Bye. Bye. All right. Are you ready to praise the name of the Lord? Come on. Sing the oh, oh, oh. You are good.